Hey, it's Jay. Uh, I'm excited. This episode's all about sports, and I love sports. I always have. A lot of people are surprised by just how much I love them, given my other deep interests in intellectualism and philosophy and all that stuff. But I really want to convince you that it makes total sense, and that sports appeals directly to my love of science and seeking truth through crafting epistemological strategies to discover testable hypotheses. How about that for a mouthful? The next two episodes are actually really closely related. This one is all about sports and taking a behavioral economics lens to learning about human behavior, and next week's episode is all about how we might avoid a civil war in this country. (laughs) On their faces, they don't seem directly tied, but stick with it. I think this analogy really works and the insights are important. So let's get into it. Sports. When I told my partner about doing this episode, she said, I don't like sports. That's it? I hate sports. All right, all right, all right. If that's you right now, just give me a few more minutes uh, to plead my case. I'm going to start with the famous Scottish philosopher David Hume. This might be old hat for you by now, but David Hume famously delivered us the is-ought distinction. Hume looked around in the universe that we find ourselves in and realized that there is no description of the way the universe is that tells us how the universe ought to be. There is a genuine meaninglessness to the universe or undiscoverability of the meaning to the universe. It just does its thing and we can never escape the subjectivity of our evaluations of it. While that has been challenged endlessly, it ultimately holds at some level. This is not to say that descriptions of the universe don't inform our oughts, or that we are hopeless to find strong moral suggestions through scientific inquiry. If we are quite sure that people don't want to experience unbearable pain in short, tortured lives, and thus it is moral to try to reduce those things, then poisoning the water supply is an immoral act. But at some level, Hume had it right. At some point, even in what I just described, I had to pull myself up from my bootstraps, which is an illegal move of logic. And this is true, even if you think those bootstraps are widely accepted and appear to be natural laws. I've seen David Hume used by both religious and non-religious thinkers to make nearly opposite points about the existence of God. The religious argument would contend that Hume was talking about the undiscoverable and unknowable nature of the mind of God. If you just sort of substitute the meaning or the ought for the mind of God, that makes sense. One would assume that God has ideas of how his creation ought to be, and thus all of our searching is ultimately in vain because we can't discover this ought, and the path to it has not been coded into the universe itself. The non-religious argument would suggest that Hume actually refuted the existence of God because the mind of God is now disconnected from the universe, which we have any access to. Therefore, if there is a God, he is inherently uninterested in our universe, and holding us responsible for failing to know the oughts is cruel and decidedly ungodly. You can take an almost religiously justified interpretation of this to say the mind of God is unknowable and only God knows how things ought to be. But get this, in sports, a domain entirely of our creation, we don't have that problem. In essence, because we are the gods. We define the laws and rules. We are the creators of the three-point shot, the penalty kick, the home run, the free throw, the touchdown. In the realm of sports, the is becomes the ought. If the Los Angeles Lakers score more points than the Denver Nuggets, then they win the game. And winning is definitionally the purpose of life in the domain of that game. Therefore, the Lakers ought to try to score more points than the Denver Nuggets. The is-ought problem is finally solved. Great. Now we get to have tons of fun figuring out the questions of how the Lakers should try to score more points than the Nuggets. And we can get to work on all kinds of hypotheses to test. Once we establish the meaning of life in a certain domain, everything becomes an attempt to measure how much certain variables contribute or detract from that ultimate goal. And sometimes those things are really easy to measure. Consider this strange analogy. By the way, in season two, I'm on a roll with these bizarre analogies. I'm not sure where they're coming from. Maybe it's lockdown, just messing with my mind, but I'm spinning out some really weird ones. So try this one. It's a new sport that I don't think we'll catch on. 
Imagine that you were filling up a bathtub with water and the goal was to have the water reach a precise temperature of 87.2 degrees Fahrenheit. If you did that, you win. Let's say there's like five other teams competing against you with their own bathtubs. It's a really weird game, I know. And let's imagine that there's a really strange series of knobs and to turn and levers and twists in the pipes and several faucets that pour water into the tub at different rates, kind of like a steampunk spa or something. The first thing you would do, I imagine, is start playing with the knobs and figuring out their behavior. You'd keep a close eye on the thermometer and keep notes as to which knobs affect other knobs and pipes and water flows and you would start building a whole system of mathematical rules and relationships in order to figure out which knobs ought to be in which positions for you to win this game and reach the correct temperature before your opponents do. I also would guess that there would be several different arrangements of these knobs that achieve the desired result and different teams would find different paths and different solutions. But of course, team sports like basketball or football or baseball don't work exactly like this strange bathtub temperature game that I just made up. The knobs are humans and humans are endlessly complex and change over time and are notoriously difficult to figure out. If the analogy is switched to a basketball team and the output you are trying to achieve is scoring more basketball points than your opponent, which players you select in the draft, which positions you put them in, when you give them a rest, when you feed them, when you discipline them, when you encourage them, when you pay them, and how much, they all become knobs that you start to turn and the fun really begins. Do you see how satisfying this kind of approach is for my analytical brain? And of course, I haven't forgotten the other aspect of sports, with the hopefully harmless tribalist impulses that fans develop to root for certain bathtub filling teams over others, simply because they play in our hometowns, or our parents love them, or we like their colors or their logos. That stuff is also, of course, part of the appeal, and of course, is a danger to discover in sports. So anyway, if that didn't convince you, maybe this conversation with John Wertheim will. John is an accomplished sports journalist, writing mostly for Sports Illustrated, but today we're talking about a book he wrote along with a co-author and friend of his named Tobias Moskowitz, who is a behavior economist at the University of Chicago. In particular, we're going to zoom in and talk about one of the faucet knobs where he and his writing partner found some really great data and definitive insights for, and that is the phenomena of home field advantage, which is simply the fact that home teams tend to win games at much higher rates than the traveling team. And we also recorded this uh, before Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. And we are all now discussing the roles of justices in our society. We draw on the analogy of judges and justices to referees and umpires throughout this conversation. I really think there's a lot to talk about there. So I'll be back at the end with some closing thoughts. Anyway, enjoy. Here's me and John Wertheim, Season 2, Episode 10, Home Field Advantage. Enjoy. Let's just start with, what is it about sports that you, in particular, love so much? Oh, man. Um, what do I love about sports? I mean, it is an evolving relationship. Um, you know, between the two of us, I'm probably not as avid a fan as I was as a kid. Mm -hmm. um, which you know, at some level is ironic. I think at some level it's it's normal. Um, I don't know. I mean, I th I think sports are just this great. I mean, some of it's journalistic, right? I mean, I think mm -hmm. it's it's a great place to write stories, to tell stories, to see people evolve. There's suspense. There's tension. It's it's become a real cliche, but sports really are a reality show and there is there's no script and there's no choreography and there's no sheet music and i think that will always be um a really enduring appeal and you know i i don't i mean i think sports are this great laboratory i mean i think i i really draw a distinction between team sports and individual sports mm -hmm. and i think we probably don't do that enough i think the dynamic is just completely different i think the athletes are different i think the, the commerce is different. I think it's a really sort of, I, I think we sort of artificially gloss it over and we sort mm -hmm. of put sports in these categories. But to me, it's almost two different pursuits. I mean, there, there should almost be like a network for individual sports and a network for team sports because I think it, it's such a differentiation. Um, 
but I, I just think sports have this real power to explain. And I think it's, it's very easy to drift off into cliche and talk about metaphors for life. But I, I mm -hmm. think there's some truth that resides in there. And, yeah. um, you know, for, for me, it's less about the, the tribalism. I come from, you know, the Midwest, from, from Indiana. There, there's when I was growing up, you know, there were only two pro teams in the state. So it wasn't really about, you know, I, I was raised on this baseball team and it was part of the family fabric. It really wasn't about the, the tribalism, but I do appreciate that's a huge source of appeal for a lot of people. But, um, you know, it, it's funny. I mean, in, in some ways, sports, it's, they, they become increasingly less rational. <laughs> and it becomes increasingly hard to justify why people, you know, the world's coming apart at the seams. Why do people give a shit about the Portland Trailblazers? But I also think there's something um, that's very logical about it. Uh, so I, you know, I, I think um, I, I think I would answer that question much differently 20 years ago, and I would answer it much recently as much differently as a kid. But uh, here we are. Yeah, I, I think I'm kind of the same way. I was brought up on a team. I'm from Allentown and it was Phillies country and Eagles country. And I still love those teams. And I love I love to dig into to some of the uh, <laughs> the hopefully healthy brand of tribalism that sports can can bind you together over something, as you said, totally irrational. It's a made up thing. Jerry Seinfeld has that great joke where he he points out that we're all just rooting for laundry running around <laughs> running around a field. Like, what does it really mean? But you sort of, uh, you know, suspend your disbelief about about the nature of these tribes and just sort of have fun with it on that level. But very much the, the words that you said of, of a laboratory and even a reality show, like that's what I want to dig into. Cause I think from a philosophical perspective, that's, that's why I'm attracted to it. It's almost this, um, you know, we set up this, uh, these rules that are arbitrary, right? Like we invented them a three point shot in basketball <laughs> is a total human invention. Like an alien coming down would have no idea unless we explained it to them. An antelope has no idea what a three point shot is, but humans, we decided there is this, this magical thing called the three point line and it's, and it's perfect in some way. So it's perfectly quantifiable in some way. So we've set up this domain that is somehow perfect and totally controlled as a closed system and then we get to do all these experiments in them. We plunge all of our humanness within them. And then we get to um, sort of see what happens. And all of the baggage that happens in non-sports world comes along with it, including our hunches, our superstitions, our myths, like you said, the poetry. And so it is this place where... Um, where, where you can, I think, find some truth within an arbitrary system. So on that topic... Um, what you wrote in scorecasting, and I know you had a co-author who was re who's a who's like a, a hard statistician and mathematician, really, so it helped you get through some of uh, some of those things. Uh, it, it was filled with all kinds of science experiments about trying to find truth. So in the non-sports world, we have these hunches, we have these ideas, we have superstitions about life or physics or whatever, and we we use this thing called science, hopefully as a method to try to contact what reality is and falsify claims. Well, you sort of, you can do this in sports, which is why I love sports so much, and you can really, the satisfying thing is you can find truth. So tell me, I'm going to focus in, as you know, when I reached out to you, on a particular chapter you wrote in that book about home field advantage and the myths that surround why home teams seem to win, and then the kind of work you did to try to maybe find out what was true in those myths. So tell me, tell me about that chapter, the home field advantage chapter, which now we'll get to it, is, is getting a really amazing, interesting, natural experiment because of the awfulness of COVID. So tell me about the home field advantage chapter. Yeah, exactly. No, I mean, I, I think, I, mean, I want to go back to what you said, because I think mm -hmm. it's a really, really good point that doesn't get made enough, which is that we love sports and we paint our faces and we wear our lucky socks and we're sure that he missed a free throw because I got up to take a leak and if I had just stayed there and, and held it in, he would have made it so that you have this real irrational. But what gets overlooked is that it's, it's um, you know, it's not just a three point shot and we can quantify it. It's that it is a perfect, in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. it is sort of the perfect site to test these experiments. It is the, the way it blends with behavioral economics. You, you've got, gazillions of data points and you have rosters that are all of the same size and sometimes mm -hmm. you even have the same payroll where there's a salary cap and everyone's performing for the same goal and you have a scoreboard so n nobody has to argue about whether you really missed earnings and you carried over a couple of charges so the numbers look better 
there's no ambiguity about the results. You can analyze every pitch. You can analyze every play. So for as, as irrational as sports are, and for as, as much as it sort of uh, brings out this, this side of us that defies logic, I think a lot of people overlook how much human behavior we can re really, with great scientific accuracy, how fiercely rational it really is. So I'm, anyway, I'm, I'm really happy you brought that up and I'm really happy you uh, appreciate that. Um, so the home field advantage chapter was basically my, uh, my my collaborator who's also you know a dear dear friend from childhood um, he and I you know sort of were, were trying to suss out what's sports myth and what's true mm -hmm. and for all the the myths in sports and the misconceptions and all the sort of cliches that don't really ring true you know de defense doesn't necessarily win championships uh, for all the myths in sports this notion of the home field advantage is not only true it is sort of ferociously fiercely true and it holds almost regardless of what sport it's held true throughout history the home winning percentage in you know by sport is remarkably consistent so the wnba is almost exactly the same as the nba and you know the la liga's home field advantage is almost the exact same as the premier league so we sort of, we just said what's going on here why is it that regardless of sport, regardless of what point in history, regardless of where we are in the world, um, there is this advantage that home teams on average win more than road teams. So we went about, after establishing it was unquestionably true, consistently true, r remarkably true, we sort of went about trying to unpack, well, why, why is that the case? And we test, we had no idea. We tested a number of uh, hypotheses. And I, I think mm -hmm. the conventional, if you sort of asked the guy in the street, he would say, oh, well, it's easy. Uh, there's comfort of playing at home and fans cheer you and support you mm -hmm. when you're home and they boo you when you're on the road and how many of us would like to go to a place of employment and get booed all day and yet it, it really it, it stands to reason certainly intuitively you think that would be the case but there's very little to support that it's not like you know even the sort of free throw percentages on the road are, are not much different than they are at home and yeah. quarterback ratings in the nfl ironically are, are higher on the road than they are at home mm. and just to pause it there because I, I don't know how, how well versed my audience is in the sports just to pause it there it's like i, I just want to lay that back out like you so the phenomenon of a, of a home team that um here's some of the myths right like they, they stay home and they get mama's cooking and they sleep in their own bed and their girlfriend is there or their wife is there they get to play with their kids they're in a good mood they go to a stadium everyone cheers for them that's why they win because they're like hyped up like they're really revved up by the fans um and uh the away team has to travel on the these these long flights and they're away from home and they might have a bad meal in the hotel and they're kind of sluggish and then they show up and everyone boos them so of course they lose more this is like the common sense place and so when you when you bring up something like the free throw talk about how like what you as a good scientist would need to find within the game to test a hypothesis like that so to test this hypothesis which again sounds completely reasonable right i mean we there, there's comfort in being at home and when i sleep in my own bed the you know the, the mini bar woman uh, doesn't come and knock on the door at three in the morning which happened to me last night um <laughs> but there, there's very so you need i mean you know we wanted to see does the data support the fact that individual performance actually does improve when you're home mm -hmm. and in sports again sports is you, you can do this in sports you can't necessarily say i argue my case better when it's it's a local case and when i have to wave into a different jurisdiction um i mean in so many fields you're not able to make these sort of declarations but you are in sports and what we sh you know what we found was that there's very little to suggest that individual performance statistically drops when you're home versus away and it's not as though in baseball batting averages are remarkably different. It's not as though shooting percentages in basketball are remarkably different. Um, there's really athlete to athlete. There's there's very little to suggest that their performance individually is, is much different. Um, we also looked at, you know, it, it stands to reason. You we we all have this right. You take a cross country flight and you're a little sluggish and it's you're eating unfamiliar food and you have three hours of jet lag to contend with but what we found was that when teams had to travel a short distance 
So in some cases, there are two teams in the same city. So you don't have to travel at all. Other times, you know, you're going Baltimore to Washington or New York to Philadelphia. There is not a discrepancy in the home percentage for those games versus Miami to Seattle. So again, it, it certainly stands to reason that when you have these trips, the, the rigors of travel are going to exact a price on your job. And yet what we found was that there wasn't really a correlation between teams playing poor the longer the trip. So it, it didn't seem as though the rigors of travel had much of an impact either. And, you know, the other thing too is that travel has changed a great deal, right? I mean, the Babe Ruth would take the Pullman <laughs> and it used to be a lot of train travel. Now, obviously, every professional team has its own, uh, has its own private jet. And yet these home percentages have stayed pretty constant. So um, again, anyone that travels for work uh, might intuitively say that, sure, you're going to perform better at your job when you don't have to travel. And yet it didn't seem as though there was much in the data to suggest that, you know, long trips were any worse for you than short trips. So it it didn't seem as though travel was really the, the answer either. And something like a free throw is so perfect again for my non sports listeners. Um, because of course the free throw line is the exact same distance. You have this perfect thing. Like what we try to do, of course, in statistics and science is flatten all the variables. So if the hypothesis is, Hey, the variable of traveling a great distance is the thing that's causing this. Well, you can flatten it by like, all right, let's look at instances where that wasn't the distance and then find something else that is identical. The free throw line is exactly the same distance. The, the hoop is exactly the same size. The ball is the same, no matter where you play. So if that was the variable that was really causing it, then, then then you would see that you would see free throw percentages dip on the road when you've traveled afar and you didn't find that or something like uh field goals in in football you know it's the same ball it's the same size you try to find these instances where other things in sports itself might be a little hard to find you can almost always in sports find the thing where all the other variables are flat and you could look at an a b thing and really isolate the variable so that i mean that's why you were able to dig into these so well so should we get to the punchline where you actually found why home field advantage comes up or or were there other myths that you dispelled even before we get to that punchline oh man i I mean i'll give you another one uh yeah you're right for your flattening variables i think that's really important right Mm -hmm. a free throw only the free throw shooter is in motion you're right the 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 space between the line and the basket doesn't change no matter where you play. It's the same number of people on the floor. We also looked at shootouts in tie games in hockey, Mm -hmm. where not only, again, it's very few variables. It's pucks either going in the net or it's not. But the other thing too is that's when the crowd is going to be at its absolutely most rabid. That's when you're going to have the most cheering for the home team and the most booing and distracting for the visitors team. And the year we looked, uh, the visiting team actually scored more goals than the home team. So you mm-hmm. had all these variables out of the equation and it appeared as though that the fans, if anything, you could make the case that the fans harmed the home team. <laughs> we, we looked at whether, well, maybe the players understand the nuances of their stadiums. Of their stadiums, and yeah. they have more comfort because they know all the nooks and crannies of their baseball field. You could also make the case that the home team actually drafts players and constructs their workforce, constructs their roster to conform with the, you know, the, the idiosyncrasies and the, the eccentricities of their stadium. Mm-hmm. So a, a team with, you know, uh, not very big outfield might be more inclined to recruit home run hitters and a team with a big outfield might be more inclined to, you know, sign pitchers and put more of a premium on pitchers. There, there wasn't much that, um, that supported that in, in the data either. So, yeah. um, you know, so, so eventually what we finally, where we struck gold. So we, you know, we, we had a couple swings and misses um, to keep the always handy sports analogies. And then where <laughs> we finally, uh, where we finally thought we struck gold was we looked at the officiating and what we found was there was a consistent bias. There was a bias, sport to sport there was a bias within sports anytime there was basically a a subjective call so a ball a strike a, a foul a penalty it favored the home team mm-hmm. and that was where sort of our ears perked up and we we dug in there 
So to, to dig into that, referees, umpires, the officiating, um, they, of course, influence the outcome of games. If you're watching a basketball game and, you know, there, there's a lot of subjectiveness, it seems, when, when LeBron James goes up for uh, to try to dunk the ball or take a shot. There's a lot of contact and there could be the whistle blown and he gets two free throws or there could not be. So that's where you really looked at all of the variables to find the influence. And, and this also um, explains how in different games, officiating can be much more impactful. Something like soccer or European football, when, when a referee in a split second can blow a whistle and give a team a penalty kick, which has a huge rate of success and, and, and is a, you know, there's not many goals in a game. So if you get a, if you get a goal, that's a huge, uh, you know, ad- advantage to winning the game. Um, that's a really big deal for a referee. So you would expect that in soccer, home field advantage would be larger than in something like baseball, actually, which, um, you know, the, the, the umpire certainly can call balls and strikes at crucial moments, but you can't award a team, you know, a free home run or something like that. Um, and you did find this. Um, so, yeah, it, and this is where you, where you, it seems to, you found in statistics, you found the, the variable, you found the, the causal variable to this outcome. Um, is it, I mean, is that, is that fair to say? And, and then we'll get into what we're, what's happening now in sports, which obviously is really interesting. Cause this, if I, if I remember correctly, it also correlated with like crowd size and, and volume of crowds as well. Like a very rabid crowd was clearly influencing referees more than a small timid crowd. A large crowd indeed. You're right. Uh, a large crowd influenced referees and umpires and officials more than uh, a a small crowd, a timid crowd. The other thing too is the closer the crowd was to the playing surface. So the the closer they were, um, the greater this, Mm. you know, the the greater the correlation as well. um, This is like Wrigley Field in Chicago. They're like on top of you versus some of these new stadiums that are a little further away. Yeah. Right. You know, because of... uh, because of rioting in, in a lot of European soccer stadiums, they even sort of built this moat separating the fans from the playing surface. And it was completely inadvertent, but we realized that one of the unintended consequences of this moat was that it, it reduced this correlation. So pushing the fans farther away from the soccer pitch actually hurt the home team and that this uh, discrepancy and subjective calls went, went down a bit. Um, the other thing we saw was that you know, the, the tighter the game got. So if it was a, a, a seven to nothing baseball game, you wouldn't necessarily have this discrepancy, but the closer the game got, if it was seven to six, um, you, you would have this, this correlation with the, the home field bias as well. It was really sort of remarkable how, how all these variables lined up. Yeah. And some of this just, if, I don't know what percentage you put on it, but a great deal of the home field advantage numbers that we see is because referees and umpires are, it, w- w- how would you even summarize that? Terrified of the crowd? I mean, they're human is what you really found out. And, and, and like you said, like who wants to be in a, in a stadium of everyone yelling at you and t- yelling terrible things because they think you're a biased umpire um, yeah. that influences you. So, so th- this notion of human psychology is at play, uh, I mean, is that is that the fair sort of summary of it? What's happening there? Yeah, no, that's perfect. Um, right. The, I, the, there is not uh, officials are not uh, corrupt, and there is nothing nefarious going on. But these are human beings, and uh, you know, in, in keeping with with twenty twenty, uh, in, implicit bias is a um, obviously a, a voguish uh, concept, but there's a lot of truth and a lot of heft to it, and there are a lot of behavioral biases at play that officials are, are not immune to as, as human beings uh they, they are not impervious to these behavioral biases and um we we, we you know it's, it's it's our belief that's what's driving this and yeah you know i mean at, at some level there, there are some instances of corruption and there is there is this notion it, it's a little sort of crass and transactional i mean there, there is this idea that you want to keep the customers happy mm-hmm. and the same way you go to a restaurant and you have a good meal and you leave satisfied, you want to come back. The same thing at some level is probably true to sports. Um, th- there is a business justification for having the home team win. But I, again, I, I don't think it's that so much as it's just basic 
behavioral biases and these these officials are, are humans at the end of the day and um, if robots and pitch fx's were officiating yeah I, I suspect those those numbers would be different but until that happens it's something we, we need to account for yeah do, do you think it would harm our enjoyment of the games to to put robots in there i mean it seems like you discovered a flaw right like it seems like you discovered a real bug in the game of sports being like oh this is this is ruining it like we've imported all of our tribal biases and our fears and our psychology into this domain that we want to be just a perfect evaluation of human performance um like i mean you didn't look at factors uh, and i guess it would be very uh, probably hot button to now like race like our white umpires giving unfair calls to black players like you could have even gone there but it seems like oh wait 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 this is actually just a total thing we want to avoid in sports we don't want human psychology of a referee or an umpire to influence our love of the game but it, but have we have i got it wrong is it actually yeah i see is this actually a feature that you found yeah Oh, I mean, I, I think it's a, a very valid and uh, I mean, I'm, I'm curious where you, you know, I'm cur- curious uh, where you reside here. I mean, part of it is, yeah, this is a, you know, this multi-billion dollar industry and it's crazy that we are tolerating error and inaccuracy when we have the ability. If we, I mean, you, you work for Major League Baseball. If we mm-hmm. wanted to, we could have every ball and strike called by robots and we mm-hmm. wouldn't have to worry about missed calls and behavioral biases. Yeah, I, we have the technology. We had it 15 years ago, <laughs> pretty yeah. much 10 years ago when I was there, yeah. Um, you know, n- name me, somebody said this, they said, name me another industry where you would tolerate this kind of inaccuracy when you didn't have to. On the other hand, what do we talk about with sports? We, we love that it's diversion. We love that it is not this this cold hard and impersonal i mean we, part of what makes it so appealing is that it inspires debate and it triggers all these emotions that we don't bring to the workplace and it is tribal and it is irrational and part of the the gestalt of sports is the imperfection of officiating and are we going to take away part of the experience is it i mean i think the it's it's not there's a sort of a Venn diagram. It's not, it's not the same point, but overlapping with that at some level is shouldn't authority figures have discretion? Mm. And shouldn't the same way, you know, if it's three in the morning and you're going 10 miles over the speed limit, the cop might let you go. And if the moms are dropping off kids at school and you're in the same street going 10 miles an hour at eight in the morning, you get a ticket. Should not we not invest these officials with some sort of, you know, some sort of latitude here. And maybe the stars should get a foul call where the run of the mill players don't. And maybe when the score is seven, nothing, the strike zone should be different than when it's six to six. I mean, I think that, um, yeah, it, at some level, it's crazy that we watch a game. I always like it when the announcers say, you know, should have been strike three, but they mm-hmm. called it a ball. And yeah. you're thinking, wait a second, I, I'm watching this on, on my laptop or I'm, you know, I could be at a cabin in Mongolia and I know what the correct call was, but the batter, the pitcher, the catcher, the umpire, the four people most proximate to the action are sort of left to this uh, subjective decision. And yet the guy, the guy at home knows with certitude whether it was a ball or a strike. That's crazy. The flip side of that is I, I would I would say that this imperfection is part of the appeal of sports and that sports would lose something if if we brought in the robots yeah i I mean i tend to yes this is part of the eternal debate and i think a really good one this human element of the game or something that we call it um where we started the conversation about why we love sports or what there is about it and we didn't really talk about sort of maybe the lessons to learn or, or, or whatever, but is it fair to, is this sort of just a, well, life isn't fair kind of lesson that you take away from it? I don't know if you have kids. I don't, but I, you know, certainly remember playing it and there was always the like, well, you could argue as much as you want, but the umpire has the final say. And there was clearly, my dad was always my coach and there was clearly a sort of life lesson being imparted there that he wanted me to learn. Everyone wanted to learn of like at some point, you know, in society, we just call them judges. It's like, well, the judge banged the gavel and you took it all at the Supreme Court in baseball is the umpire or the referee. Well, now there's a little bit of video review that we could talk about. But is this sort of is this part of a a um, 
I don't know, aspect of reality and our maybe psychological experience that would be lost if it was just pure robotic, like you can't argue it because the data is the data. Yeah, well, I think that's interesting. I mean, I think you're right. I think there's a micro, you know, I think there's a micro reason of, of right. Life isn't fair. Sometimes the cop pulls you over. Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes right. the judge rules for you. Sometimes she doesn't. But I also just think this official imperfection, right? I, I think it's all part of this suspension of real life, I don't know, whatever you call it, of a rationality of a real life. Part of the whole reason we like sports is a suspension of reality and otherwise dignified people are painting their faces and otherwise rational people are convinced that if they don't wear their lucky socks, the Minnesota Vikings are going to lose. And I think having officials spot the ball in the wrong place or call the strike the ball or don't call a foul, I think it's all part at, at some level of what we like about sports we talk about this this cliche of sports as reality show well you know in reality shows sometimes the, you know the, the wrong guy gets the rose and sometimes the the judge should like kelly clarkson more than he does <laughs> and i i think it would detract from our love of sports uh, of course the flip side is sports are big business there are huge financial consequences i mean these these athletes Never, never mind the athletes who make tens of millions of dollars. I mean, the, these teams are worth billions of dollars and sports gambling. And are we not corrupting the business when we don't strive for maximum accuracy? So, I, I mean, I think you really have these, these countervailing forces, but I think part of the visceral experience of sports is here is this space where we don't act the way we usually do. And I think yeah. that um, sort of treat, treating this like, uh, you know, I, I think that's why sort of tangentially, I think that's why analytics get some pushback. Mm -hmm. We don't want cold, rational numbers. We don't want flawless technology. We want there to be subjectivity and unpredictability. And this is an, um, you know, th this basketball referee is notorious for X, Y, Z. You don't have that when everything is GPS tracking and algorithms. Now, to bring it to the current situation, because COVID has changed sports. They've all, well, in the U.S., they've sort of basketball restarted in a bubble. They're all doing it a little differently, so we're going to have to talk about this carefully for people who aren't following it. Basketball restarted in what they called a bubble, where every team is in Orlando under the same roof, pretty much, playing uh, their games. There are no fans in any of these, so that's a huge variable we'll talk about. Baseball restarted, and they are traveling. They're playing in their home stadiums, except for the Toronto Blue Jays because of the Canadian border. They're playing in Buffalo. But everyone's traveling, but there are no fans. Uh, cardboard cutouts. The NHL is also playing in a bubble, I believe. It's like two, two little locations. Um, and so you are getting a nearly perfect natural experiment to talk about this notion of if you say it's the fans and not the travel that are influencing umpires and referees, um, to change their calls, well, we should be seeing differences in the home field numbers now. Something like baseball, it's almost the perfect experiment. What you're getting is the teams are still traveling, they're staying in hotels, although th there's a variable there that the hotels are worse than usual, I guess, for everybody because they're, they're all quarantined. Um, but there's no fans. There's cardboard cutouts sitting there, although they are pumping in noise, which which is <laughs> which is a very hard variable to talk about here. So I just looked it up and I'm going to probably release this a little later. So I'll, I'll update the number. But I looked up where we're at right now. I don't know if you've looked at these numbers lately. Maybe you, I don't know if you're afraid of the science experiment. All right. So this is where we're at right now. Major League Baseball, this is after 100 and or 200 and. 30 games that they've played in the restart the home field team the home team is winning 52 percent of the time which is less than the 55 percent 54 percent that usually happens so we're, we're we're about there and and the one the one variable about baseball also is it's the one game that we're talking about that actually has built into the rules a material advantage to the home team which means meaning they bat last which is a kind of advantage of knowing how many runs you have to score and might affect some of your strategy so we given all the flattened variables we still would expect to find a small home field advantage in baseball so it's about 52 percent um right now which is down so you're looking good uh hockey which is normally at 60 percent or 59 percent right now and their restart is also at 52 percent so still looking good because <laughs> it's below where it should be uh, or normally is 
and basketball basketball right now is at 58 percent, which actually is lower because the NA, in nba it's about 62 percent. so home field advantage is is your your thesis looks good and is being suppressed in all of these sports right now simply by taking out the variable of a crowd yelling at the the referee i i can't stress too in these bubble scenarios mm -hmm. uh how clean an experiment this is i mean there are players who literally can't tell you after the game whether they were the home team or the visiting team. <laughs> yeah, in, in the NBA, there, there should be nothing that actually explains it because literally the, the, both teams are li in the same place and like they just designate one team the home team and they wear a different colored jersey. Is that it? Like The, uh, the only thing I could possibly think of... No, I mean, you're, you're right. I mean, they, they, um, I mean, the players literally have to look at the scoreboard to see what, <laughs> whether their team is first or second. No, I, I was trying to come up, if, if somehow this didn't hold, if in fact home field advantage went up, which is mm -hmm. of course what you would not expect, what could possibly account for that? Mm -hmm. um, the, only, the only possible explanation I, I could come up with, I mean, for, first of all, everything goes out the window during COVID and, and nothing should be, uh, this is a right. strange period. No, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe there's something about these games are going to be viewed so intensely and there is such an audience on this that there might be an overcorrection by officials to uh mm. get every call absolutely bloodlessly right because um they know there's that much more attention i i don't know i mean i was trying to seriously i was trying to uh if in fact home advantage went up i was trying to come up with any conceivable reason why that would be the case and i i did not have much luck i don't know if you uh help uh, me out I I don't know about in soccer, in baseball, if it goes, the, the pumping of the crowd noise <laughs> perhaps is, is actually like the, there's a, um, there's all these famous psychology experiments of people doing, um, you know, cheating games and laboratories and all kinds of donation games. And if you simply just have a poster in the room that has eyeballs on it, they perform differently, even though, you know, it's not really a person looking at you. It triggers some sort of evolutionary social pressure to do the right thing. And so just literally pumping in crowd noise, cheering. And although I don't think they're pumping and booing when an umpire gets it wrong. Uh, so so it doesn't quite, you know, no, no one's yelling your mama jokes or whatever through a loudspeaker when the umpire does something wrong. I think you're, uh, I think you're but, onto something. I think we need to incorporate that. Yeah, that is, home teams should do it. I, I mean, the, the, the truth is, is like, and I, and I wanted to backtrack a little bit of this notion of what you wrote about and I think discovered in that chapter, which I've obviously been so drawn to, um, it, it almost feels like a dirty secret, but I'm sure teams know this. This is a billion dollar industry. I'm sure they've done a lot or they've read your chapter and now are trying to game the system. Uh, I wonder if it's influenced some of these stadiums to try to pump in a kind of crowd noise um, knowing that they're actually influencing umpires and referees as the home team. I guess you get it. You get control over that volume dial is, is pretty much your advantage now. No, why, why stop there? I mean, maybe these cardboard cutouts actually need oh. to be uh, you know, doing things or celebrities or um, I, I do want to go back to what you said before, because I, th I think that's important too. When, um, you know, we, we made the analogy to the, the Starbucks tip jar and if, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the money kept disappearing. And if you, you put a camera in there and if you told the employees, look, there's, there's going to be a camera on the tip jar and the tip jar was no longer, uh, you know, there, there was no longer larceny of the tip jar. You could reasonably suspect that it had been an employee. And now that they had all been alerted that there was a camera on them, the, the money stayed there. You, you would assume that previously it had been one of the employees, right? And I didn't articulate that well, but um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the what, what we've seen in sports as well is that when, you know, you, you work for Major League Baseball, when the umpires were told, hey, listen, we're going to have pitch FX for this game and we're going to be assessing you based on your accuracy level, the home advantage on balls and strikes went down. So this mm -hmm. whole idea of surveillance really changes behavior in sports as, as it does in, in so many other sectors. And I do wonder, I mean, we have seen home advantage slip a bit in some of the sports in the last 10 years. And we posit that technology plays a big role in that. And when calls can be overturned and when there are replay challenges and even just sort of, if ne never mind the challenge, even just sort of the specter that we now, anyone with a 
phone can slow down a play and see if it's really goaltending. Now that you have this surveillance element, um, has that changed behavior as well? But, but I think you're right. I think in these games that are now being played in bubbles, if teams really wanted to get creative, there, there probably are ways within the guidelines that they could, uh, that they could kind of gin up some of this, uh, some of these factors that in conventional, you know, non wartime times, uh, Mm -hmm. lead to this home advantage. Yeah. I I think it's fascinating. And I mean, to, to make the parallels to society and bring it to some of the more serious stuff. I, I mean, the obvious parallel that I already brought up earlier is umpires, referees, these officials of our games are equivalent to our police officers and equivalent to our judges and equivalent to our, our lawmakers in society. Mo- judges is the best one. Um, and it, it, I, I think that the parallels to the variable that, that you're finding or you found of crowds and audiences and sort of a, a Roman Coliseum actually doesn't affect the players, but it affects the officiating. Um is it is an interesting and uh, cautionary sort of discovery about about our justice system and about about the way that society works? I mean, do do you see? Uh, I mean, we do this all the time. But if a case gets too much media attention or a big a big media case, the judge we're always very careful about who's on the jury and who the judge is and who's being influenced. It seems to be almost a perfect analogy of you. We like this level of sort of human imperfection in a thing where it's a game because we sort of get off on the irrationality and the arguments and the high fives. But in society and in something very serious like a like a trial, we don't want any of that. And so your discoveries within sports actually can export as cautionary tales in society to point us to where we really need to to squash things. I guess I'm asking a more broad question about what we investigate sports, but sometimes the discoveries are very relevant to to non-sports. I think the analogy to, uh, to to the justice system, I'm not sure it totally holds. Uh, I mean, I think you're right. Like, I mean, Lance Ito would have been a really crappy home plate umpire. I mean, the the more, (laughs) uh, the the more attention a trial gets, um, the, the more that can sort of sway subjectivity. I mean, I think there's some critical differences though. I mean, one of them is these are not people that are appointed for life. Um, These are also interactions. I mean, an an NBA, pick an NBA ref and he may have the same player, you know, several times in the same month. So this is a relationship, right? I mean, you, you know, the home plate umpire and his tendency, you may know the judge, this guy's really tough on crime but you're only shit out of luck one time. You don't adjust your behavior because you're going to be facing him or her again and again and again throughout Mm. the season. And I also think that players understand economics these days and they understand power and the same way that they know that they make more money than their coach. I think they realize that these are not lifetime appointments and uh, an, an umpire that you know, arouses uh, dissatisfaction among players probably isn't isn't long for the job. And I think I think that creeps in there too. But I, I think your larger point's really well taken, that it's really easy to sort of transpose this this relationship and uh, sort of what what authority means and what you know it's how we interpret laws, mm-hmm. um, you know, strict and loose construction. Um, there are a lot of applications to this relationship that uh, that apply elsewhere. And uh, I, again, it's a really interesting balance, I think, in sports between how much we want black letter law and, and how much we're willing to tolerate discretion. Yeah. And on that note, you mentioned it in passing before, but one of the other major variables that you found with the same how this referee and umpire and officiating bias appears is in favor of star players and players with big names. So LeBron James is much more likely to get a call than the rookie and the last guy on the bench who no one's heard of. Um, and, and like you said, some, even with, with the crowd, of course, going nuts because LeBron James is LeBron James, that assists it. But even without the crowd, that's going to be true because the referees know who this guy is. They, they're not dumb. They're not blind. They know who the stars are. They know who has the name and that influences them. Um, and that is something that's quite so talking about power dynamics and how as an individual, even within a team sport, an individual can game the system a bit. I don't know how far I could really push this, but if you were an NBA player, it behooves you, I think, to become a celebrity 
and be, to become a big name any way you can because it actually will will influence the kind of calls you get in the game. Does this mean you should become like a huge, you know, Twitter sensation? Maybe. And I, and I think we're in an interesting and maybe this again has an interesting analogy in society about the sometimes um, uh, strange way that power dynamics are at play with who can influence politics or influence conversations based on their um you know their name their their power their their media presence you know um it, it, that was one of the findings that i thought was was quite interesting and i and i don't i don't know if players are, are keen enough right now to know like hey i might not be a great player but if i become you know dennis rodman may have been a great case if dennis rodman was a sensation beyond the court and i'm sure helped his although his his kind of attitude on the on the court may have not ingratiated a lot of officials um but it helps becoming a celebrity that, in our world and in sports. Yeah. No, it's a really good point. And I would have said 20 years ago, Dennis Rod, you would have said, well, why is that the case? Well, there's this business justification and you preserve yourself. There's something evolutionary about it. You want to give Michael Jordan the call. We all benefit from having the star system. I think you said something really, really interesting, which is, you know, this, this is almost sort of an outgrowth of cancel culture. Now it's, mm -hmm. I don't want to mess with Draymond Green, not because he's the celebrity that the league needs to protect in order to keep the commerce sloshing, but I don't want the scrutiny of, you know, getting into a social media war or having my work <laughs> scrutinized by this influencer. Yeah. And I think I think that's really interesting. If, if you can't be LeBron James, be Draymond Green, be someone outrageous who has an outsized personality because at some very subconscious level, no no officials gonna want to be in the crosshairs of uh, Draymond Green's social media tirade. Yeah, um, you know, no, no one gives a shit what the the eleventh man on the Pacers says or doesn't say about officiating. But there's certain players where it's gonna really complicate your life to uh, have your work scrutinized publicly by that. I think I think that's really. I don't know how you would ever devise an experiment. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what that, I'm but, thinking of. Yeah, but it's really, you know, uh, uh, NBA officials don't want to get canceled uh, either. So uh, that's really interesting. Yeah, I think uh, the experiments to run there are actually this probably brings up maybe something that I really want to talk about is um, where this conversation is now drifting is the part that like it makes me so itchy and nervous about the 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 overlap of politics and sports but obviously it's a thing and it's always been a thing and i should probably not shy away from it um because <laughs> if you hit a hot button button issue like saying if you said a, a referee was racist and you really did the data and you were draymond green or something and the data like that's some dangerous powerful stuff because you what if you did what if you you ran the numbers and you did the kind of analysis you couldn't even be like you know what this referee calls a whole heck of a lot more fouls on black players than white players when we flatten all the variables uh that really might be a thing that you could discover which is really hot button stuff um and we're talking about uh we're talking about power dynamics and consequential political and philosophical conversations seeping into sports um in a way that it maybe is unavoidable like i said like this is part of life and it is not sealed off from the rest of life but also makes me nervous of course on and on my mind is trump and all of his constant interjections into kneeling and what's happening in sports in this way that that i just hate because i, I would hate to see the culture wars overtake and become the sports wars i've seen things like that happen for a small anecdote of you don't need this but how how bad sports tribalism can get when it overlaps with non-sports tribalism. I went to a soccer game way back in West Africa, um, which in Ghana, and it was their local soccer um, league, which is really fun if anyone's ever seen it. I was watching the Asante Kotoko uh, play the King Faisal team. And these teams were very much split along religious, racial, or religious tribal lines. It was the Muslim team versus the Christian team. And it was very tense and it was very, uh, it, was, it was a pretty good game. It was like two to one. And uh, it's not at the game I was at, but a year later there was a riot when those two teams played in the stadium and like hundreds of people died uh, because 
tribal overlapping being amplified by sports tribal sort of uh, triggers is not somewhere where we want to take society. And obviously we're nowhere close to that with American sports, but you see, you see the, the echoes of it from far away and we just have to be careful there. I just wanted to sort of plant that with where this conversation is going. And I don't know your thoughts on it, um, but it's why, it's why I think a lot of people are turned off by sports because they see the ugly side of tribalism overlap with what you hope is a kind of protected, fun, almost mock tribalism that we all know is irrational in sports. Uh, but it's, it's a fine line. We all know. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it it stands to reason, right? I mean, the same way some umpires are known for generous strike zones or some NBA refs are known for tolerating more contact than others. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, check me on this. I think Justin Wolfers, um, an economist who used to be a ward, I think he's now at Michigan, I, I think he tried to devise a study hmm. about that, about in the specific to the NBA. I mean, I think it's very hard to, um, to sort of, support that empirically i mean i think it would be a it would be hard sort of to make the case based on yeah. data but yeah i mean i think if officials would be very susceptible very susceptible to that and uh it, it only needs to be perception for it to get really ugly yeah. um i think you know i i keep thinking that one, one sport that i cover um pretty intensely is tennis yeah yeah and you have this replay on, on whether you used to have these close calls and you say who the hell knows and right now you have this this replay so every call is essentially appealable to uh to technology mm -hmm. and the players tend to love it they get clarity they perceive they don't have it stuck in their head that anyone is biased against them but it really has had the effect of bleaching some of the color out of the sport mm -hmm. and I, I think, you know, sports are going to have to reckon with this. Um, sports are going to lose something. And, and if, yeah, yeah I mean, I, I personally, I don't know who in their right mind would ever want to be a sports official. You talk <laughs> about thankless, talk about thankless jobs and you talk about no win propositions. And it, sometimes there, there's an element of danger involved, but I think, yeah, it, it may get to the point where people just say the hell, the hell with this. I don't need to be called a racist. I don't need to have death threats. I don't need to be booed. I don't need to be told that my mom's a whore. I think sports would really lose something. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I mean, how, how about we just end it with a little celebration of, again, like we're all isolated. We're all in our own places and how, how important sports is to, uh, or, or if you think how important, how important sports is for us to come together and get over this stuff we can end with some of the fluffier kind of stuff you know when the olympics got canceled at the beginning of this thing it was it was heartbreaking for me because it felt like the one thing that the world kind of needed to come together on um and i hope it happens next year i don't know if it even will um i don't know i don't know yeah. give an yeah. appeal to to what it's, sports can do <laughs> no it, it's funny because you usually sports are this bomb right and a B -B -A -L -M bomb um and you know the new orleans is ravaged by katrina but here come the saints to win the super bowl and they make things better and sports are diversion and we all love the yankees after 9 11. Mm -hmm. this crisis is completely the opposite you mentioned the olympics jay i mean imagine if i said to you hey it's the middle of this global pandemic we're gonna have this event mm. in japan and people are gonna fly in from all over the world and the athletes are all gonna stay in something called a villain <laughs> <laughs> and have lots of sex and sleep in beds near each other. And then they're all going to compete uh, bear hugging each other and, and sweating on each other. And, and then go and, back home to their know, home countries. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. And then, and then, right, millions of fans, they're all going to come in and then everyone's going to go back to their home countries. Oh. Uh, you know, and it's the same way, you know, 100,000 people are going to go to a football stadium and yell their lungs out, uh, packed closely together. So, it, I mean, in this crisis, sports are almost uniquely ill-positioned. Oh. And yet... What do we look for in times of crisis? We look for comfort, we look for distraction, we look for diversion, and God damn it, if the Portland Trailblazers are playing the New Jersey Nets in front of uh, 11 cardboard cutouts, I'm gonna watch. So yeah. I, I think, um, you know, I, I think that the, the NBA, for example, has been a great source of comfort, and there haven't been positive tests, so I, I don't, we don't feel guilty for watching, we don't feel necessarily as though these athletes are subjecting themselves to sickness and death for our enjoyment and i've noticed that the nba talk has it started out as the bubble and tests and sort of funny stories about 
being quarantined and now it's hey you know the trailblazers are making a run and the phoenix suns are better than we thought and there really is such comfort in having this completely irrational diversion sports have never seemed at some level less important we're mm -hmm. all worried about health and safety and systemic racism and this is reckoning and the economy what could be less relevant than whether devin booker is improving his three-point shooting <laughs> and yet my god it's so comforting to I get know. back to just wondering about sports and watching men throw balls into baskets and then you know and then women as well yeah <laughs> that, that, that's pretty beautifully said i feel the same way um after 9 11 i i remember going to the phillies games with my family and seeing the american flags i mean the phillies were out of the the pennant race by far this is when they were still really terrible but it was a sold out stadium playing the atlanta braves um I don't think you had to be a sports fan to watch Mike Piazza hit that home run in the game when the Mets came back. I mean, I hated the Mets as a Phillies fan, but I loved that. You know, it brought me to tears. And it uh, it does seem like such a cruel, cruel fate that we're in that we don't quite get that. But we do have, yes, we, ha we, have, a, we have something like it. We're watching on TV. We're doing our best. I think it's pretty, I love the cardboard cutouts. Um, there's this little app that you could like cheer in the stadium by clicking a little button and feeling like you're there. I mean, we're... We're doing our best. That yeah, I think it speaks to the human the human power to find comfort in the irrational when reality itself just feels a little too uh, heavy. And I, yeah, and, and as we've talked about this entire thing, that doesn't mean it's a pure escape from rationality or a pure escape from reason or even a pure escape from engagement from the world. Because sports, at its best, is a pure science experiment of our abilities as humans where we come up with silly games i mean it's a, it's a silly game from the beginning two cavemen saying like hey i i think i can run to that tree faster than you it's fun and we kind of need it and you can discover amazing things so i mean your book's incredible we really only focused on that one chapter um but i love the book and, and frankly I, it's, a, it's a sports heavy book but i think it appeals to non-sports fans and you've written things since then so what's your latest book it's on tennis right your your recent one um, what's my reason? I just finished up a book on, um, it's not out yet, on the, the oh. summer of 1984 and all these sort of cultural forces. Um, oh, wow. Man, what else? I, I don't know. I mean, no, this this book was, uh, it was a lot of fun. I mean, some of it was just writing it with, uh, with, with a dear friend. But yeah, yeah, that was, I mean, I'm really, I'm really heartened to hear you say that because that was the goal. It was to give it to my wife or give it to someone who might not be even a huge sports fan, but would come away with, with a bit of an understanding and sort of see that uh you know at, at some level the, these athletes you're, you're right there, there's no necessarily there's, there's no evolutionary function here but whatever they they are more accurate shooting a basket in a, into a hole and they mm -hmm. jump higher and they run faster but in the end there's there's a lot of sort of basic uh behavioral science and a base i mean you, you said it about the officials at the end of the, they're human beings and uh at the at the end of the day we, we always say sports are this metaphor for life but the truth is that life basic human behavior basic behavioral biases has a huge impact on sports as well so it, it kind of goes both ways um well this was really fun uh i'll keep checking on the data because i'll probably release this in about a, a month so i'll update on it i can email it to you have my spreadsheets going here uh, your thesis looks good i don't expect it to be falsified your data and your science experiments w w was quite strong but now this variable of just pumping sound in is like <laughs> kind of ruining the pure experiment but also interesting in its own right so um yeah it's awesome this was really really fun all right all right that was fun all right thanks, all right. Jake. thanks man I have some updated numbers for you. At the time of this recording, which is Thursday, September 24th, here's what I got. The NBA, that's basketball of course, currently has the home teams winning only 51.85% of the time since they restarted without live fans. Uh, in previous years, the number was around 61%. And in ice hockey, a sport which usually sees a fairly large home field advantage of 59%, the COVID season has the home team winning just 45% of the time. Now, both of those situations aren't perfect experiments since the variable of travel has been removed. All of the teams in hockey and basketball are living in the same geographic bubble. Uh, though they are, they have virtual fans and they're pumping in crowd noise, so it's not a huge sample size, but it might appear that virtual fans and cardboard cutouts aren't scaring refs nearly as much as real humans yelling at them. 
But I looked at early data from some soccer leagues, the English Premier League and Spanish La Liga. I combined their data and it shows home teams winning only 46% of the time. Normally, both of those leagues are around 63, 65% of the time. So that's pretty significant. And the baseball data is flat at the moment at 54%, which is what it always is. So the hypothesis appears to be surviving the natural experiment beautifully. So John, you can, you can, rest, <laughs> you can rest easy, it's working. So let's just say it definitively. What causes home teams to win more? Is it the travel wearing down the opponent? Is it your lucky socks? Is it the home team being super jazzed and energized to perform in front of their beloved fans? No, it's the officials being intimidated and seeking approval from their fellow humans. It turns out they just want to be loved. Suddenly remembering that this is not a sports podcast, I'll shift to what I think are some fairly profound questions lurking here for our psychological lives and futures. This kind of discovery reveals just how difficult objectivity really is and just how susceptible to social pressure and large crowds we all are. Umpires and referees are professionally trained to apply a set of rules uniformly and blindly, and we see how easily they can be swayed by the pressure of a rabid crowd ready to pounce or applaud. We have people with similar kinds of positions in our societies, in our schools, on our police forces, in our governments, in our own families, and of course, our judges. In sports, we may actually kind of enjoy the element of a home field advantage even after it has been discovered to be more about biasing the law enforcers of the game through intimidation rather than any kind of lucky socks or rooting for LeBron James. Maybe it's kind of fun letting ourselves believe it really was about encouraging our favorite player to try his hardest because the hometown kids were all looking up to him. And we could keep fooling ourselves to tell magical stories, or maybe we like it even after learning the truth and realize exactly where our effect on the game is, which is harassing referees. And that actually helps your team and, you know, can be kind of fun anyway. But out in society, we don't want home field advantages. If we find them, we really ought to do something about it. I'll save the politics and hot button stuff for the next episode, but you don't need to stretch your imagination too far to glean what I'm hinting at. I love sports because our hunches and hypotheses about what is causing what can be put to the test with well-designed experiments and data analysis of these closed systems can lead to apolitical late night debates and conversations about what your favorite collection of laundry should do to score more basketball points the next time they try and why swapping one player for a certain other player would result in more of those points. You know, how fun. Nothing prevents us from applying these same techniques to society at large But we have to be honest with the data. The lucky underwear you're wearing to help LeBron James make his free throws would have been a fun story. But if you want to actually win some basketball games and you happen to be the GM or coach of the Lakers, you might want to take a more serious look at things. And one more thing about the referees as judges analogy. If we take that analogy seriously, the buck stops with the referee in sports. If you are sure that he got it wrong and your opponent's foot was on the line and the shot that he just made should have been worth two points rather than three, and every camera on earth shows that same thing. But the referee shrugs and says he thinks it was a three-pointer. At some point, you have to accept the ruling or else what? The game just stops? The sport just stops? No one knows who actually won? You both win? There's an appeal process in some leagues, but let's say you appeal the game and the league shrugs and says, well, the referee may have gotten it wrong, but they can't overturn the results and the referee's word is final. Well, what do you do? Do you show up for the next game? Or do you break off and start a brand new league and insist that you actually won? One of my favorite sports highlights happened in 1999 when Albert Bell, who was a big home run hitter for the Baltimore Orioles, stepped up to the plate late in the game. He had already hit, I think, three home runs in that same game and was eager to take a shot at his fourth. And the other team was getting kind of annoyed at Albert Bell crushing them. And so the pitcher threw the first pitch at Albert Bell and clearly struck him on the shoulder. In baseball, when the batter is hit by the pitch, he is awarded first base. He has no choice. He goes to first base. But Bell refused to go. He stayed in the box. He wanted to hit. And in this strange scene, the umpire pleaded for him to just take his base and go to first. Even his own manager came out to try to talk to him and coax him and convince him to go to first base. 
he eventually did go and the Orioles actually won the game with the next batter but what if he didn't what would have happened (laughs) could we have just ignored the rule just that one time could we have just pretended that the ball really didn't hit Albert Bell because we're all just so afraid that he would go ballistic and hurt someone (laughs) if we tried to make him go to first well I don't know, but again, you don't need to be Nostradamus to know that I'm talking about the upcoming election and the possibility that our votes will end up in the court. Anyway, that topic is for next week, but maybe this sports episode and a discovery about home field advantage is a bit more irrelevant than you thought at the beginning. So I don't know if I convinced anyone to like sports. I doubt it, but maybe I gave you some insight into exactly why I find them so perfect. It's a place where David Hume is finally wrong. Something that many of us wish he actually was. Okay, so next week, I'm just biting the bullet. I'm doing an episode about the election coming up and the nightmare scenarios which seem sure to follow. I tend to like this show as not reacting to the headlines day to day too much and providing a more zoomed out approach to thinking, but I can't help but stare at the buzzsaw that we all appear to be shuffling towards in the next few months. And I guess I just have to talk about it. Next week, I'm talking to Mike Selinker, who is a really interesting video game designer and puzzle maker who imagines a bunch of different scenarios using his game theory brain of how this nation might splinter into a civil war sparked by a constitutional breakdown. And of course, how we might be able to avoid that, which maybe in this sports episode, there were some lessons. Anyway... It'll be fun, I suppose, so find me in a week.